Thank you everyone for joining us today and welcome to the Adventure Spotlight. This is the last in the series of our virtual spotlights that we've been having going with Grand Dynamics for the last couple of weeks. And the Adventure Spotlight is, is almost like a, a dream come true in a different sort of way. Uh, Ken and I have been talking about this concept of getting people together around the idea of adventure. And it started out with you know a retreat-based experience that we wanted to have and invited people. Uh, actually, we ended up creating an Adventure Spotlight out in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which ended up being canceled this year due to the pandemic, of course. But nonetheless, we uh, this is a dream come true. So thanks for being a part of it. And I'm really excited to, to kick this off with our first one and see where we go with it. Very excited about our special guest, Charlie Engel today. Charlie, thanks for being with us. And uh, John Losey, thanks for doing the production on the backside. And of course, Ken, uh, thanks for uh, hanging in there as we've been creating this for such a, such a long time. So a little bit of context uh, about the virtual spotlight. Um, this is the last in our series we've been doing for the last few weeks. Raise your hand if you've been a part of any of the other spotlights uh, with Grand Dynamics so far. Yeah, a bunch of people. And raise your hand, the other hand, if this is the first spotlight you've gone to. Bunch of people there way, that way too, yep. Um, just a little bit of context, the last six weeks around the virtual programming. If uh, people are interested in finding out more about that, we've been covering a whole lot of different great topics. Uh, we started out with mastering the virtual world with technology and engagement strategies for effective meetings and events. Uh, we had magic in the virtual entertainment with a featured uh, amazing magician and lots of different entertainment options for virtual programming. Uh, our third in the series was gaming with trivia, whodunits, uh, virtual scavenger hunts, all sorts of ways to create gaming events. Um, and our most recent one was fundraising and charity give back events uh, with Mac, Mac Campana featuring the Hands of Gratitude, which we're also uh, releasing a uh, program where you can actually order these Hands of Gratitude for Thanksgiving week and participate with that with us uh, if you want to join in on that program. So uh, today, that leads us to our last in the series, which is the first of a whole bunch of new programs and adventure spotlights that we'll uh, talk more about and what we have in store for the future. But whether, you know, the, the adventure experience is something that is different for all sorts of different people. Again, we have, we have runners and bikers and racers and people that create their own adventures. And we're all living through this adventure in the pandemic and how we're navigating life, business and sport. And sometimes we create our own adventures, sometimes we're just thrown into them. And here, we're here to learn some stories and strategies uh, from Charlie, our special guest about how we can optimize using adventure as our guide. So before we dive into the program today, we wanna to start out with a little bit of a, a connection piece, three minutes. We're gonna go into a, uh, a breakout and once we do that, you'll just have a couple of minutes to introduce yourself. I'll introduce that in a minute. When we come back, we're gonna, I'll introduce Ken and Ken will begin to interview Charlie, hear some stories and talk about the applications of those programs. Um, John's also gonna put in a Mentimeter uh, link where you can ask questions. At the end, we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A, interactive Q&A. So we'll dive into those questions that you have. If you have a question at any time, put it into the Mentimeter slide and we'll be going back at that at the end. And then we'll finish up on next steps where we can continue the conversation and how we can go from here. So John, if you could create the breakout rooms and what we're gonna do is we want you to just introduce yourself, you know, share where you're from and just share a little bit about why you seek out adventure and what does adventure mean to you? Just, you'll have about a minute each. So three minutes really quick, breakout room, we'll come back and get us warmed up on the topic of adventure. All, All right. right, here we go. We're gonna send you out to those breakout rooms. Um, let me know if you have any difficulties. Here you go. Look for the link on your screen and head out to those breakout rooms. Who are you? Where are you from? And why do you seek adventure? Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, John. I like the beard, Ruben, looking good. Thank you. All right. All right. So is everyone everyone funneling back in? I'm going to do the gallery view. Okay. 
Very cool. As everyone's coming back in, what I'd love to, I mean, how many people had a very interesting conversation right there in just those few minutes? You meet, meet some interesting people, raise your hand. Yeah. Uh, just as a way of encapsulating just a little bit of that conversation, uh, type into the chat you know, a couple words or a word or two that kind of summarizes or highlights your conversation around uh, around the adventure part, like why why someone in your group seeks out adventure or, uh, yeah, just kind of a summary. Um, what did you learn about, you know, adventure? Why, why people seek out adventure or what adventure means? Just put it into the chat room and let's see some of those comments. I had a great conversation uh, with Doug Lewis, man, and met a former Olympian who's in the middle of 135,000 I think in the month, is that right? Geez, yeah. he's like uh, doing some serious vertical, but you know, the one word that that uh, we talked about in our breakout room was alive, right? Adventure makes us feel alive. And you know, when we're amidst this whole pandemic, what better way to to, to focus on of, uh, than, than feeling alive and, and navigating uh, our, <laughs> our life sport and business. So with that, uh, th thanks again for everyone for joining the Adventure Spotlight. If you just came in, we just came out of our breakout rooms. We just had our connection piece, and we are excited to get into the program here. Uh, we have an amazing special guest, which Ken Lubin will give a proper introduction to in just a moment. But before the introduction of Charlie, I'd like to give you a short introduction of <laughs> Ken Lubin. And... Uh, Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar and know about Ken Lubin through the LinkedIn group, uh, Executive Athletes. If you don't know about it, you can join that group and follow his posts. Very inspirational all the time. And uh, Ken and I have been talking. We was actually introduced by uh, Mr. Stephen Koch, which you probably guys know, several years ago. And ever since, we've been talking about how we can collaborate and rally a community together and start creating a retreat and live experiences around the adventure concept. And, you know, Ken is a fascinating guy and, uh, you know, in his real job, he, he finds, you know, peak executives and puts them in the right position, seeks those folks out. So if there's anyone out there looking for a high uh, caliber executive job, Ken's the guy to help you find that and getting you in the right position. Um, and, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, he's always getting out and getting after it. Love our conversations. Every time we talk, we're talking about, you know, what we did yesterday or today and the pain that goes along with it sometimes. But he's an adventure racer, does a lot of alpine skiing. He was uh, the winner of one of the famous, uh, the famous Vermont death race, which is a 60 hour um, just adventure race, the famous one in Vermont. Uh, and, you know, in his home life, he has a really cool thing called the pain cave. So he goes in there and gets his workouts and loves to share them. So uh, if you haven't listened to his podcast, you can check out his executive athlete podcast. And really, this is kind of the extension of the podcast where the goal is to make this interactive, fun, and really connect some of the stories to the strategies to help people in life, sport, and business. So with that, Ken, I'll turn it over to you to say a few words and introduce Charlie and get on with our get on with the rest of the program. Thanks yeah, for coming. Yeah, no, and thank you. And thanks, everyone, for dialing in. Many familiar faces. Uh, one thing I want to give the shout out, though, is Doug Lewis, actually, who's on here, won the original death race, and he didn't even know it was the death race. So he's the original guy back in Vermont. Uh, so sort of a shout out there. But in all seriousness, I've, you know, this world of executive athletes, this world of adventure, the mix of business, sport, life and adventure that we all live. And I think many of us every day are just trying to push the limits to see what we can and can't do. Um, from running vertical to just making it through the day sometimes. And <clears throat> so it's been a blast to meet such inspiring people. Thank everyone here for you know joining us with this whole thing. But throughout this journey, I've had, you know, <laughs> it's sort of crazy. I get hooked up um, with Charlie Engel at this event up in Vermont, a different event, but similar type place up at actually up at the farm in Vermont that we um, we were at and he and I immediately hit it off and it was very interesting because he's an adventurer I'm an adventurer he's been through some crazy stuff that I can't even come close to you know saying I've ever been part of or I don't think I would ever want to be part of some of the stuff that he's been through but 
what I learned from Charlie early on, I remember the first night we're just grabbing some dinner at, at the hotel or actually appetizers is how humble he was, um, how, you know, he sort of has the ability to go with the flow like no one I've ever seen before. And he's got, a, you know, a unique ability to, to, con to calm people. He's a very calming voice. He's someone who is always willing to help people and to really service people. So I don't know if you know anything about Charlie, but he's probably got one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. Um, you know, started out as an, well, he didn't start out, but turned into an addict, successful salesperson, turned into an addict who then found running um, and running crazy distances. Never mind just going for a 5K or running the marathon, a Boston marathon, but it culminated with pushing the limits and adventure racing, doing Raid Galois, doing the Eco Challenge, doing, you know, things that we think, you know, are superhuman. Charlie thinks is just like a Tuesday. So one of the things, though, that is the most fascinating story, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more, is Charlie embarked on running across the Sahara Desert and running 50 miles a day across the Sahara, which is... I, I, I can't even imagine what it's like running in sand, never mind, mind running across a desert that long and that, hard, that hot. But I think that actually pales in comparison to some of his other stories where after that, or actually he did it to raise money with Matt Damon, a document, documentary came out, but then was actually in federal prison for a while. And we'll go into that story, but you know, running 100 miles in federal prison throughout the courtyard is something that is absolutely mind blowing to me. But Charlie's so humble about it and just kept it rolling. Came out, continued a very successful running career, and is now speaking and inspiring people all over the world. So, Charlie, welcome to this and thank you very much for being part of it. Man, Ken, thanks for that. I, you, I need to take you with me everywhere I go. You just, you really helped my self-esteem right there. I don't know if I'm humble anymore after all that. So, but I, I want to thank you and Tim for, uh, for having me. And, and I'm excited about this conversation. Um, the best friendships like yours and mine start where within an hour you have a climbing helmet on your head and you're greatly uh, exposed somewhere on a rock. <laughs> and that's how... That's how our friendship started. And uh, I, I do want to say one quick thing. A uh, shout out to a couple of buddies of mine. I see Sean Nielsen on here. And many of you may know Travis Macy. I see he's uh, joined. And, and for the record, Ken and Tim, uh, Sean, I mean, uh, Travis should be your, your next guest. He's, uh, he and his dad, uh, Mark Macy, were the stars of the recent uh, Eco Challenge on Amazon. So an amazing adventure athlete. So anyway, thanks for having me. Let's, uh, let's get this show on the road, man. No, and, and talk about that, right? Talk about, first of all, let's talk about the Sahara. How did you ever come up with that idea of running across the Sahara? Because running that long is crazy, but running that long through the sand is even crazier. So talk a little bit about that 111 days straight, the mindset, and tell us, you know, some of your thoughts when you're rolling through it. Hey, you know, first of all, who knew Africa was that big? I probably should have checked the maps a little more closely. <laughs> my my eighty day adventure turned into a hundred and eleven days, and uh, it was kind of one of those things that I think we all do from time to time. We hear this great, interesting idea, and and I like to say that sometimes words said to us by a stranger in passing can actually change the entire course of our lives. And I was at another race in the Amazon jungle, laying in a freaking jungle hammock and uh, watching the ground move below me because it was basically alive. And some knucklehead in a hammock next to me is like, hey, you ever thought about running across the Sahara Desert? And I literally, I told him, I said, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. It's like, why, you know, why would you do that? But I couldn't stop thinking about it. And when I got home back to the US, I did some research and I found out it had never been done before. Go figure. And I, and I think everybody on this call can probably relate to uh, the, I don't know, the, I guess the lure of adventure and especially one that hasn't been done before. And I started to just put it out into the universe that I was gonna be the first guy, first person ever to run across the Sahara. And, I was working as a TV producer for Extreme Makeover Home Edition at the time. And 
I had a couple of connections and I couldn't afford to do this myself. It was a very expensive undertaking, but I, you know, I sold the idea. I sold the dream to a couple of people. And, and one of them was an Academy Award winning director and the other was Matt Damon. And, uh, you know, you get two Academy Award winners attached and you wake up one morning and, and you kind of go, oh, shit. I actually have to run across the Sahara Desert. And, and that's kind of, that's really where the whole concept came from. And I always like to make the joke that when a sponsor or, or someone putting money into the project said, are you sure you can do this? I was always like, oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, there's no doubt. And like friends and family would say, are you sure you can do this? I'm like, hell no, I'm not sure I can do it. And that is almost, I, I think, gets to the core of even this conversation and what I admire about what you guys are doing. Adventure is, for me, all about that, that little fear or sometimes big fear at the beginning of some new big project and where you actually, you don't know if you can do it. It's not like running your 50th marathon or something where you actually are pretty sure you're going to finish. Like, I like that feeling of starting something that I have no idea if I'm going to be successful because that's, that's where the good stuff happens. And raise your hand if you've ever jumped into something like that, right? Way beyond any scale of what you thought. I can tell you, you know, a few things I've gotten into. It's, you know, it's scary as all get out. And then next thing you know, you're like, oh, that's easy, right? Once you get through it, it's amazing. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, running 50 miles a day. What's, what's the mindset like? What's the logistics like? And where, you know, how do you overcome some of the things that are really, your feet hurt, you get sand in your shoes, you know, that type of stuff. I think that would probably take more people out than actually thinking about running 4,000 miles. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. And I, and I think what happens to people and, and what I had to learn to do, well, let me put it this way. Seven days into my very long expedition across the Sahara, uh, we were about 200 miles behind already. Ground temperatures were 140 degrees every day. Look, I'd been planning this thing for a year and a half at this point. I thought for sure that I had identified every potential problem that we were going to have. What I didn't account for was that they would all happen at the same time. <laughs> and so we ran out of food. We ran out of water. We got lost in a sandstorm. Two of my support people quit. My two fellow runners that were out there with me were both on IVs by day four. They were so dehydrated. And I realized that I had been, so, the big mistake that I was making was I was so focused on getting to the finish of this thing. Like I had been thinking about it and felt the pressure of accomplishing this goal that all I had been thinking about was getting to Egypt all the way on the other side of this, <laughs> putting my feet in the Red Sea. And I realized, you know, those of you who know anything about my story, I'm, I'm clean and sober now for 28 years. And the, the basic tenet of sobriety and, and recovery from addiction is one day at a time. We've all heard it. And I recognize that I, I had gotten sober and stayed sober by focusing on what was right in front of me. And in the Sahara, I started focusing on the miles that were gonna be in the next country or later on instead of what was right in front of me. Wow. And so on day eight, I really changed my focus to think only about you know, the first marathon in the morning on day eight and then taking a break and then the second marathon in the afternoon and then being done for the day and, and looking up at a billion stars and giving thanks you know, for the opportunity to actually be out there alive and suffering and being fully present in the moment. And by changing my focus to just, I mean, and look at this time we're in right now in the world. Anybody who tells you they know what's gonna happen next week, next month, or even next year at this point, I wouldn't buy it, you know? And the approach has to be, I can only run the miles that are right in front of me. And the sore feet, you know, what happens, I think, and to a lot of us is we make big decisions and very often bad decisions when we're at a very low moment. So things will be terrible. Our, we got blisters, we're dehydrated, we're certain we can't go on like any farther. And that's when we make a decision to quit. And that's, that's the wrong way to go about it because that moment will pass. You eat some food, you drink, you get a little rest, you keep moving slowly. And this is a metaphor, not just for racing, but for life. 
and things will improve. So you have to be careful not to pull yourself out of something uh, too soon, you know, and for the wrong reasons. And so I think that's how we made our way across the desert. And, you know, I mean, it, it plus the fact that it was really hard to get out of there. You know, I was in the middle of the Sahara Desert. There was no bus coming by to pick me up. Yeah. Yeah, no helicopter wants to come out there and do it. And and everyone who's listening to type in the chat some of the, you know, craziest adventures you've done. It could be say, hey, I lost 50 pounds or 100 pounds or I ran my first 5K or, you know, I just did 60,000 vertical feet over the weekend or something like that. But, you know, everyone would probably love to hear everyone else's adventures. Um, talk to us about Charlie. So you came out of the Sahara, you know, you're on cloud nine, you're, you're hanging out with Damon and celebrities, you're doing all the whole thing. Then you get thrown in jail. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, good times, man. You know, <laughs> this is a I, crazy uh, story. Yeah. So, you know, we ran, we ran 50 miles a day for 111 consecutive days without taking a day off. And this I got on Jay Leno and all the morning news shows and NPR, and I got a speaking agent, you know, signed with William Morris, and I'm speaking and working on a book, and I have all these amazing opportunities. And about a year or so after that, I uh, really was just out running errands in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I I came back to my condo and. Uh, uh, I saw movement out of the left-hand corner of my eye and like six armed federal agents came and arrested me and put me in the back of a police car. And I, you know, this is all in my book if anybody wants to read it, but it's the shortest version is um, a tax investigation had been opened while I, while I was in the Sahara Desert because apparently the single IRS agent was concerned about how I was paying for this. Apparently he'd never heard of Matt Damon. And uh, this led to me actually fighting this in federal court. And I became the only person in the United States to actually be charged with overstating my income on a home loan application. And this is in 2010. And this home loan application was 2000, from 2005. And so I was, I'll say it again, overstating my income on a home loan application as just a borrower. And as for that, I could get 20 years in federal prison. And it is the greatest example, certainly in my life, of how quickly things can change and how uh, you can be up here and very quickly uh, bottom out again. All the sponsors went away, no more speaking gigs. I was booted off the board. You know, Matt Damon and I started what is today uh, the largest clean water nonprofit in the world, water.org. Uh, and it all came from this crazy idea that running across the Sahara would be meaningful in some way. And, you know, I was let go from the board, understandably under the circumstances. And my kids actually dropped me off at federal prison. You know, I fought this thing at trial, but I was found guilty of mail fraud, which is just another whole story related to this thing. And on Valentine's Day, 2011, uh, my two teenage boys dropped me off at the door of Beckley Federal Correctional Institute in Beckley, West Virginia. And uh, I was going to be there for the next year and a half. And, you know, it was, I was sad and I was uh, scared. Uh, anybody would be going into prison and I was really pissed off. And what I figured out very quickly was that it's all about perspective and, and bitterness and anger was not gonna serve me well in that circumstance. And I had to figure out, you know, who I was gonna be in there. And the first guy that I met, you know, and this is the way life works sometimes. Black gentleman in the cell next to me, early 60s, and he had been in prison for almost 25 years at that point. And he, he had been there for one single gram of crack cocaine. And, you know, perspective is really enlightening sometimes if you're paying attention. And I recognize that what I actually had was an opportunity. You know, it's not an opportunity I would have chosen for myself, no doubt but it was an opportunity for growth. And I approached prison the same way I approached a hundred miler or running across the desert with you know, an open mind and a curious heart. And I wanted to see what was gonna happen. And this experience ended up teaching me so much because I started to run and we were in lockdown quite often. And sometimes I would run for six or eight hours in place in my cell. And people thought I was absolutely nuts, <laughs> which, let me just tell you, it's not actually a bad thing when you're in federal prison, but um, 
you know, they thought I was nuts. And, and slowly but surely, people started to come up to me. And I think everybody on this call, I'll bet you, has experienced this. They started to come up to me and say, can you teach me how to run? And it's because of what I call attraction rather than promotion, right? It's this idea of not, it's not about what we say. It's about what we do, the actions we take and how it improves our lives. And someone else is always watching, right? Somebody else uses us as a mentor, whether we know it or not. And we are always mentoring somebody else, but it's not about what they say. It's about what they do. So when I got to Beckley, I had about three, there were about three guys running every day. And by the time I left a year and a half later, you know, I had 50 guys in my running group running every single day. And I had more than a dozen guys who lost a hundred pounds or more while I was there. And, you know, I had, I had inmates doing yoga on the softball field three days a week. And, you know, when this was all over, and I know we talked before about service and, and how important it is. You know, when the experience was over and I was, and I was let go um, from prison, all these guys came up to me and they hugged me and they thanked me for what I had done for them. And I was actually baffled because what they didn't realize is that by giving me an opportunity to be of service, by just simply sharing the knowledge that I have about running and maybe about addiction recovery, that got me through the experience. Like if it hadn't been for the opportunity to do that, I wouldn't have gotten through it. And so again, I wouldn't have chosen the experience my, for myself, but you know, the universe puts us in places where we have the greatest opportunity to benefit, not just ourselves, but others, but we, we have to pay attention. And, you know, I always say comfort is overrated. You know, nobody learns a single thing from the easy things in life. And, you know, that's why we choose adventure. Prison was a different kind of adventure. And uh, I don't recommend it, actually, as a vacation or anything else. But, um, you know, I think most people, if they approach it right, could get through it. Well, and I think, too, it's, and that's what we were talking about earlier, that people were posting on the thing. Adventure is sort of a lot of times what you don't realize, right, is when it comes to you. And I believe me, 2020, I think, is an adventure for all of us. And, and coping mechanisms and, and mental toughness and resilience. And what you've done there is, is just amazing. And I think, you know, the resilience piece is huge. And, and talk to us about that mindset, right? The resilience piece in when you're running the Sahara, you're in, you're in federal prison, you're coming out of federal prison, right? And then it's the world is open again. Talk to us a bit about, you know, the psychology of that, right? Because you're going through many different phases of your life, but crammed into a five-year period? Yeah, man, it's such a great question because I, I also acknowledge, and, and not to get too deep into addiction and recovery, but, you know, when I first got sober years ago, you know, I used AA and running to get sober. And for three years, I actually ran like as hard as I could every single day because I I thought if I just ran hard enough, I could actually cut like the addict out of me. I could get rid of that piece of me. And, and this speaks to resilience. What I actually learned was through those three years, uh, the addict is actually all the best parts of me, right? Everybody on this call is successful in what they do. And we talk about balance quite often, but to be genuinely successful at whatever you're trying to do, there has to be a certain amount of obsession, right? I mean, I've known you for a long time now, and there is there is an obsession when you take on a project that means that you're out of balance. You, you have to focus on that thing for a while, and it might be to the detriment of other parts of your life, you know, hopefully not, uh, you know, selling your car and ignoring your family, but you know, the fact of the matter is it takes that kind of obsession. And what I learned in that phase was that resilience comes from the willingness to always just focus on continuous forward movement. You know, I, I can only, everybody knows this, I can only control my effort. I cannot control the outcome. So when I got out of prison, you know, I felt like I was probably, you know, marked with a big giant F for felon. Uh, you know, and that my life would never be the same. 
I, I don't think I've ever told you this, but I like one of my favorite movies ever is um, is Eminem's movie Eight Mile, which sounds like a weird choice, but for those who have seen it, um, you know the last battle in this film, this resilience uh, film, is you know Eminem having a rap battle with this other guy, and he gets on stage on stage, and he actually spends his ninety seconds, you know, talking about the fact that he lives in his tra in a trailer with his mom and his best friend had sex with his girlfriend. Like he basically dumps all his own stuff out there. The point of all that is that I, I think very often, certainly for me, I was afraid of what people might think of me and how I might be perceived, especially after my time in prison. And I felt like the only way I could get through that fear was to own it and was to just get on stage and say, look, this is what happened. I'm not complaining about it. I'm not making excuses. Like most things that happen to us in life, there are a combination of two things, self-inflicted wounds and stuff that comes out of the blue. And if we're honest with ourselves, some of the things that kind of come out of the blue, we do have a hand in creating the groundwork that led to that issue. So I freely admitted that many of the challenges I faced in my life, not just, in my, I admitted to myself and to others, a lot of those challenges were, you know, I had a hand in, in creating the chaos and the problems in my life. And what it taught me was resilience comes from the knowledge and the experience of going through hard times. You know, comfort is overrated and hardship cannot be avoided. Uh, to try to go around it is actually a waste of time. No, it's sort of the stoic philosophy, right? Of them embrace the hard, right? The obstacle is the way. And and like you said, is once you once you embrace that and it's part of life, it's it is what it is. And I think many of the people listening here are all business people. They've been through, you know, three recessions in the last 20 years, 01, 08, and whatever is going on now. I don't even know what to call it anymore, but the pandemic recession, but we always seem to come out of it stronger than, than we went into it. And I think, you know, Charlie, you've done that. I think a lot of people, if you don't give up, and like you were saying earlier, one step at a time, one day at a time, you can actually, you know, overcome amazing odds. Yeah, well, what happens to us, and you heard me say this a million times, what happens to us isn't nearly as important as what we do about it. Mm -hmm. you know, good and bad stuff happens to absolutely everybody and it's packaged differently for each person. You know, I talk about running across the Sahara. Any of you out there who started a business could, could lay your business and, and where it started from day one as a metaphor for running across a desert or a jungle or whatever. It really is the same thing because you, you, know, you have to wake up every single day and recognize that you need a plan. Right. We all need a plan right now. But if you expect your plan for today, and I, I literally mean today, <laughs> if you expect the plan that you're creating today, that's going to you're going to use tomorrow and next week to go exactly the way you planned it. Best of luck to you. You know, I mean, that's for me. I know maybe my plans are just too disorganized, but, you know, I just know that mine don't go that way. And in fact, you know, to try to make them go that way is counterproductive to my, you know, to my learning, you know, I, and, and by the way, I don't magically, you know, some challenge does it hit me and I, and I go, oh my God, this is fantastic. You know, I have COVID, you know, which I had back in April, or this is fantastic. I get to go to prison for a while. I wonder what that's like. You know, I, it took a while to get there. And, and I think that we have to cut ourselves some slack and recognize that, you know, we put on the, the brave faces very often, but it in fact is that fear. I would also say too, this call right here, this, this, you know, this symposium we're having right now, to me is about sharing the struggle. And too often we all get in the habit of sharing the successes. And sure, we might talk a little bit about struggle, but I mean, the only condition that I think every human shares, truly shares is struggle. I don't care who you are. And if you share it with other people and say that out loud, express that fear, you know, put it on the table, uh, it diminishes right away. No, and that's the, you know, the vulnerability piece, right? You know, if you look at generations in the past, 
you couldn't be vulnerable. You couldn't tell anything or you'd be like, you know, thrown to the nut house. And now it's just the opposite. It's like, here, let's help each other out. And I think it's a generational thing that's changing. And with social, I, you know, I think it's actually helps with social media because you're actually saying, oh, I can, I, that person's struggling like that, or this person's struggling like that. Or right now I've talked to a lot of people saying, hey, everyone's got time on their hands call someone, send them a note, check in, either check in with them, or if you have any questions, reach out to them because they're happy to talk about their journey to what get them, what's got them to where they at and where they're at. And, you know, that's what I love about you. Man, you really nailed it. I mean, everybody on this call right now knows at least one person that they should call. <laughs> that person that, you know, you, you think about them, oh, I really need to call that person, see how they're doing, check in with them. And, Yet we, we don't, you know, and we're, none of us are, are that busy. We think we are, but I think that that's really important. And this, this idea of service, service can be small and it can, or it can be big, but it is the best and fastest and most effective way of getting out of your own BS, at least for me. You know, if I am struggling and I feel, um, you know, useless, which still happens. You know, I, I still wake up some days and I judge myself based on what I've accomplished lately, not who I am as a person, because I, I still feel like I need to check another box or I need to add another thing to my resume in order to feel worthy of, you know, anybody else's admiration or even my own. And, and I don't think that that's a uh, I don't, I'm certainly not unique in that way. And I, and I think that it's important to share those things. And, you know, service can be as simple as just walking out your door and with your mask on, by the way, and um, not even knowing how you're going to help somebody else, but, but you'll know it when you see it. And then yeah. it can also take the shape of uh, someone that you just simply reach out to and ask if you can be of service to them or, you know, in the recovery community, which by the way, I, can't, I would be remiss not to say right now, the opioid uh, crisis and drug crisis in this country right now is actually far exceeding anything we've ever seen before. And when and if all of this mess is over, um, when they tally up all the deaths from overdoses and from, you know, look, man, none of us can even hug each other these days. It's right. driving me crazy. No, and, no. you know, it's going to be devastating. And we all need to like, you know, we need to push for greater mental health services, not just for addicts and recovering people, but for, for all of us. No, and everyone here, give Charlie a high five. You can do it, you know, do the, you know, the, uh, you know, the virtual or type it in. But Charlie, this is awesome. And I know Tim actually has a number of questions too from the listeners. So Tim, I'll defer to you with, with some of those questions. Yeah, great. Thanks. And wow, thanks, Charlie. What a both fascinating and insightful. It's just like listening to some of the just all these different words that are coming out. There's like kind of uh, like light bulbs that I'm listening to. So uh, thanks for sharing the story. And maybe uh, everyone that's listening here, type in one word that just resonates with you or a few words, if you want, from from some of the stories that you're hearing from Charlie around uh, some of these insights. We'd love to just kind of see a list of some of those questions or some of those the thoughts that are coming to you that are most relevant. Um, so I do have a series of questions that have been submitted from the gallery. The first one is, uh, how do you overcome the initial fear or self-doubt to begin or to start something? Wow, that's a great one. And I, I immediately pops into my head this idea of first experiences. You know, I. I give a talk sometimes even on this idea of, you know, how we, in my opinion, I know for me, and I think for a lot of you, we all kind of spend our time chasing uh, firsts, you know, first job, first car, first love, first whatever it might be. And it, that I said this earlier in the talk where, you know, if you run your 50th marathon, you probably don't step up to the start line of a marathon and wonder if you can do it. And not that you shouldn't do that and enjoy it, but there's something missing when you don't, you no longer have that fear of, can I get this done? And so I, I think it's this idea of trying to embrace first experiences 
first of all. So remember what it felt like and that edgy nervousness and anxiety that you had. And instead of like dreading that, welcome it. You know, look at the value that came from that. So if you're a runner, you know, move up in distance, go try something you haven't done. If you haven't ever mountain biked or tried an adventure race, if you've, if you've got a business, but you've always wanted to do this other thing, you know, a side hustle or a full on new business, you know, there's no greater fear and more useful fear than the one that comes from discovery. And, and that only happens when you try something you haven't done before. No, thank you. That's so great. And, you know, I, in some of our previous conversations, I know you, you've mentioned some really great ideas around uh, what are some things that people can do now? Like there's not any races that you can attend, but um, you know, what are some, some ideas that, uh, that people might consider for like a, a home-based challenge or something like that? Um, I mean, great, great question. And I, look, I had a guy who, who emailed me last week and uh, you know, with all due respect to him, he wanted to know um, uh, if he could talk to me about running across the United States. And, you know, I wrote back and I said, hey, no problem. I'd love to. Why don't you send me some, you know, tell me what you've already done. And, and then I'll have a sense of, you know, it's like somebody asking about food and diet. The first thing you ask goes, well, what are you eating now? And so he wrote back and he said, you know, I've run a half marathon, two of them, in fact. And, and look, and I wrote back and with all due respect, I was like, look, man, I, I hear you. I hear you that you have this, this idea that you want to run across the U.S. But how about instead of like starting with 3,000 miles, basically, when you've only run 13 at one time, why don't you plan uh, an excursion across the county that you live in? Like, 45 miles, you got to go to the to the library or to somewhere down at City Hall and get a map of the county and you can plan this route out. You might be able to just do it on Google. You know where the quick marts are that you can start and stop and, you know, maybe get, get somebody to support you and come out there and, and, you know, and be there with a vehicle and drinks and food or just put on a backpack. Point being, pretty obvious, you know, they're stepping stones and experience does matter. And so in this time right now, we, we see this proliferation of what's called FKTs, which a lot of you know are fastest known times. People are creating these, um, you know, these self adventures all over the world right now. Uh, and they don't have, you don't have to publicize them, you don't have to do anything. But the opportunity to not just enter someone else's virtual event versus just creating something of your own, maybe getting a couple of friends involved or at least some support. It's huge and it's so satisfying. I mean, nothing to me is more satisfying than making a plan, having it all go wrong, <laughs> which it will, and then figuring it out. There's nothing better than that. I so, so agree. I mean, it's, uh, and thank you for sharing that. And, you know, the idea is, you know, I'd love to see part of this community of people sharing concepts in, in this adventure spotlight. And by the way, we just opened up our first Facebook group. Um, maybe, John, you could put the, the, the link in there for to continue the conversation and to share some ideas. But, you know, the, the ideas of creating your own adventure, living your own adventure, um, whether that's, you know, go, running across your county or swimming across the lake or cold immersion, you know, all these different things. Um, and, and doing those in stage approach. So a follow-up question to that, uh, great one. Thanks for submitting these questions. We got some great ones. How do you plan for the fact that there are going to be things that you can't plan for? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's late no, it, 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 I mean, honestly, that is where the fun comes in. And I freely admit, um, you know, it's wrapped up in ego. It's wrapped up in, in so many different things. And, and, once you accept the fact that things are not going to, I'll give you a great example. I ran across the Sahara, right? 111 days. I kept a journal every single day. I wrote in this journal, the plan for the day for 110 consecutive days. I went back and looked at that journal uh, after the expedition, a couple months after, and on like eight days, it went exactly the way I wrote it down, which means that on more than a hundred days, it went either a little bit wrong or absolutely completely to hell. And yet, and yet, we made it all the way across the Sahara Desert. And so I, I, I think that, 
you know, you have to try not to make the incredibly stupid mistakes. You know, if you're going for a night hike, it's probably a good idea to bring a headlamp, you know, things like that. And try not to make the huge, like really obvious, simple mistakes. But not only should you count on the other mistakes happening, the blister, you know, you get a blister and you've worn this pair of shoes for two years, this type, and you've never had a blister before, but it'll just happen. Trust me, that's just simply the way it works. And, you know, you have to wrap your mind around the fact that it is an opportunity. And look, I've never, this is maybe the best way I can say it. I've done dozens of hundred milers, for example. I've never entered a hundred miler expecting it to be easy because no matter how many of those I've done, I'm always scared at the start line. I entered that race for the specific purpose of getting myself to the place where I want to quit. That's why I'm there. And then I want to find a way to get past that. And you know, the only moment or moments that I remember from that event are those moments. I don't remember the easy, I couldn't tell you the first, if it's mile 63, when I first have the, the, the thought that, okay, this sucks, I hate this, why am I here? I can't even tell you, looking back, you know, what happened in the first 62 miles. You know, because it was just fun and games up till then. But the point is, you know, the, the part that mattered was when I hit that wall and had to figure out how I was going to get through it. No, I love that. And, you know, the idea of I'd love to hear even a little bit more about, you know, what do you do when you're in that moment of, OK. And there was a question that came in that says, you know, what comes first, control of the mind or control of the body? And I think, you know, the relevance to when you're having your moment, and we've all had those moments, whether in, in all sorts of, you know, parts of life, right? You want to quit, you know, whatever it is, the business project, the relationship, the, the challenge, the physical, the exhaustion. Um, so, you know, it maybe in relation to the mind and the body, how do those, you know, relate to one another in this idea of like, how do you get through those moments where you're at the bottom and you're like, oh, man, just okay, I got to take one next step, or what's your strategy for that? You know, this is why physical adventures are so important in life. So running races, whether it's, you know, running, biking, swimming, triathlon, adventure, whatever it is, because they are technically controlled situations. And this is what I love about it. Rarely, sometimes it can be, but rarely is it life or death. You know, you can go run a marathon and look, if you make the decision to quit at mile 22, it probably isn't going to do anything other than teach you some sort of a lesson and you're going to want to go try again. So the point of, the, of this answer is that experience is a huge teacher, but the only way you get experience is to go out and do things. And, and I do think finding a way to push through that moment in a physical undertaking translates exactly Two, your relationships in life, your business ventures, your family and raising kids. Because if we trusted our instincts and acted on our impulses at our lowest moments, I mean, first of all, none of us would be on this call right now. <laughs> and it's just simply the way, it's not the way, you know, we have to learn that through experience though. You know, you might still quit the job or the relationship a, a week later but don't do it at that low moment. And, and I will, I'm gonna extend this answer uh, into the sobriety world. And this is where I really learned it. I sponsor tons of people and I have through the years and everybody kind of knows about sponsorship and sobriety and guys will call me and they'll say, hey, look, I want a drink today. I want a drink. You know, and it could be somebody that's got six months or six years or whatever. And I never tell them, don't do that. Please don't do that because I don't think that that's enough. I don't think that that helps. What I actually say is, I love humor, so I usually say, if I had your life, I'd want to drink too. And, and I think it's important to kind of, you know, take the pressure down just a little bit. And I say, look, I get it. Things are bad right now, you want to drink, but just do me a favor. Don't do it today, get a good night's sleep, call me tomorrow. If you still want to drink, I'll go pick up the six pack and I'll bring it over and we'll drink it together. I don't actually mean that, but in all, all the years that I've said it, not one single person, except with the exception of one guy who had already relapsed a couple of weeks earlier without telling me, no one has ever done anything but call me the next day and say, oh my God, I am so relieved and glad that I didn't drink. 
because we make those bad decisions in moments. And if we can just learn to let that moment pass by for five minutes, for five, whatever it is, it will change. That is a fact. God, so, so great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, man, so many, so many different lessons. I just want to make a quick, a couple quick announcements and let people know that we're also going to hang out after the hour. Uh, so if people want to hang out for a bit longer and, and continue the conversation, um, we have a couple different ways that we're also thinking about continuing the conversation. We literally just added this Facebook group uh, that you can join and it's just a group. So we're going to open up the conversation. We're going to be featuring our new uh, speakers that we have planned and experiences. Um, we're also going to post a, a survey monkey link in the uh, in the chat room and we'll email that out afterwards. But we would love to get your feedback on the concept of what we're doing, the adventure spotlight. I mean, this is literally the first time we're doing it. We're thinking about how this is going to involve, how often should we do it? Um, if you're a speaker out there that wants to be a featured speaker, uh, then we want to hear suggestions on that. And th then the format, is this a interesting, how is this different? Is this a, an engaging format to more of an interaction? Would you like some different interaction? Um, and so just getting your ideas on that would be grateful for uh, any comments or feedback that in the survey monkey and joining the Facebook group. Um, and then again, you know, Charlie, obviously Charlie is a, a professional speaker. If anyone's interested in uh, more of Charlie's information, you can contact info at grandanamics.com. You can look up Charlie on his website and you just search Charlie Engel. And uh, he does this for a living, uh, you know, live speaking and now more virtual events. So I obviously want to support Charlie in that effort. And again, uh, the LinkedIn group, um, Executive Athletes with Ken Lubin, you can connect there for some inspiration and connection to other people that are like minded. Um, and, uh, you know, as we're going through again, we have a few other questions if people want to hang out and and uh, and continue on for a little longer. But I just wanted to, before we got to the end of the hour, thank everyone. Uh, thanks, John, for the production. Thanks, Ken Lubin, for a great interview and for kicking this off. And, and thank you for being a part of the inaugural Adventure Spotlight. And uh, we're very excited that you're here. And um, I'm excited to ask a few more questions if, you, if, if you're good with it, Charlie, because there's a few other questions that came in here um, that I would love to hear. But, uh, what, before I do that, let me just say, Charlie, do you have any other final thoughts before we wrap up the, uh, for Charlie and or Ken, if you'd like to say something, um, before we kind of include, conclude the official session here? Um, you know. you know, I'd like to say one thing, Tim, thanks. And, and again, I, I like to always let everyone know that if you've heard anything today, that's interesting to you, especially around addiction, uh, and recovery running, uh, we didn't even talk about nutrition. You know, I'm a plant-based athlete. Um, you know, I, I represent a company called Go Condition. It's important to me. I have a book. There's, all that's on my website. But the point is, I'm easy to reach. Like anybody, can, that's my phone number and my email on my website. And if you have a question about addiction or nutrition or running or anything else, but you don't want to ask it publicly, by all means, just reach out to me and I'm happy to be available to you. Oh, and Charlie and Tim and John, thanks for being part of this as well. Like Tim said early on, this has sort of been a dream of ours to, to pull this off and really to have it, um, you know, the importance of getting out there, getting outside your comfort zone and pushing the limits a bit. And I know we're all pushing the limits a bit. I think we're probably all have COVID fatigue. We're probably pushing limits backwards, but our, our TV watching limits, but no, in all seriousness, I think it's, there's opportunity to come out of this. I think we're in some unique times, but like one of the, someone had asked Tim, what can you do at home? It just starts with doing some burpees or running in place or, you know, seeing what you can do for five, 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, three hours, but it's all right there in front of us. So thanks everyone for listening and checking us out. And yeah, definitely. I'll, we'll be around too. And if anyone wants to reach out to me, can reach out to me directly as well and Tim will put stuff there too. So thanks everyone. Yeah, awesome. Cool, well, let's give a, a big round of applause for Ken and Charlie and yeah, all right. Awesome. Um, and for those of you that wanna stick around a little bit, we can have a kind of a little bit of an intimate conversation for a few minutes um, and you know, keep the keep the program going for a few, for a few more, for those that wanna stick around. Um, the, there was an interesting question that came up I thought would be good to pose for you, Charlie, which was, um, 
Can you speak to the spiritual dimension of adventure? And, you know, did spirituality play a part? Um, you know, how did spirituality play a part in some of your adventures? But can you speak yep. to that part of it? I can. Yeah. <laughs> I can. As you know, I can speak to anything, Tim. So I, <laughs> all I do is talk. No, I, you know, so look, I'm not a, personally, I'm not a particularly religious person, but I, as it relates to addiction and recovery, you know, I've learned a certain kind of spirituality, but I didn't really learn it until I finally started getting out into the mountains and into the jungles and the deserts around the world. And I recognize that those moments when I was either by myself or surrounded by a couple of friends and having a particularly sometimes painful, sometimes beautiful, ethereal, whatever that moment might be, it's that, that sort of shared acknowledgement of the circumstance that lets me know that I'm, I'm doing the right thing, I'm in the right place. I would also say that, you know, very often people look at, I like to say I attract people maybe with accomplishments. They want to hear running across the Sahara. I, I got to tell you, the most interesting part about running across the Sahara was going through 200 or so little villages where I was on foot. You know, I wasn't driving into this village in a Range Rover, right? Or in a Toyota 4Runner. Like I was on foot, just like pretty much the vast majority of the people that I was encountering. Mm -hmm. And if you've never done that, you know, if you are an adventurer and you're going to some far off land, get out of your car, you know, a half a mile before you go into a village and try walking into the village instead of driving. Put yourself in the same position as the people that you're gonna see. The reason I say all that in answer to spirituality is the human connection, cultural exploration is why I travel. That's why I go to these places. I'm not a, I'm a decent athlete with a more than average stubborn streak. And what I really am after though, is the experience of human interaction uh, in a place that I couldn't have imagined, that I actually couldn't have imagined myself being in. And that's why I keep going back. And, and I think that that's, you know, you can't force it to happen. You can't force those moments that you're recognizing almost like an out of body experience that this is special. But those are the ones that imprint and stay with me. And I don't need a photo of it or a video or to put it on social media. It's, it's right here and it's there forever. Wow, awesome. yeah, yeah, that's so cool. I mean, in all the adventure travel, I, I, I can so relate to that. I mean, it's, it's, it's the fuel and the energy comes from the connection, the culture and the people that you get to meet, you know, and to be able to connect people on a more, you know, human level on their level just opens up so many different conversations and experiences. And, and, uh, you know, the, the fuel for a lot of the, the challenges and you're in those kind of uh, cultural exploration experiences, I think, you know, that spirituality part comes from the connection of the people, you know, that you're kind of integrated with. So, um, yeah, totally great. Um, let me just toss this out there to the gallery. If you have a question that you want to ask directly to Charlie, now that we're kind of hanging out, you can raise your hand by just doing, um, you know, putting up a reaction, I guess, or, or you can just raise your hand in, in the gallery if you want to ask a question directly to, Ch to Charlie. Um, if you open up the participants panel, um, you should be able to see a, uh, uh, you can put a check mark or you can do something like that, or you can, you can raise your hand there. Okay. John, uh, you have a your question. Hand, John. Yeah, go for it. You got to unmute yourself. Yeah. Just did, as a matter of fact. Hey, Charlie, John's up hey, John. in Philadelphia. Um, nicely done again, man. And you've helped me a ton already in the past. Uh, question for right now. Um, I have a buddy who uh, is going through COVID. And I know that you've come out the other side. And without sharing who he is, he also happens to be in recovery with me. And yeah. so I understand, and I know he understands the day at a time concept, but I also know that this is a little bit different. How did you navigate through, especially in the beginning? What were, what were some of the things that got you through? Man. John, what a question and a, and a tough one. And to be honest, both my wife and I had had COVID back in April. And right. while I recovered fairly quickly, she is still to this day very much in recovery. And, mm -hmm. and so we are dealing with it a day at a time. 
I could actually hear she was on the phone doing a virtual uh, medical appointment just a little mm -hmm. while ago when we got started. And, right. um, and the fear that I have from that kind of thing, especially as a person in recovery, is yep. almost overpowering. I mean, because I, I'm okay with my, look, I put myself in danger a million times. I, my <laughs> own uh, sort of ability to survive things uh, you know, I, I feel like is, uh, is well proven, but also, you know, I, I almost felt like if I had like died out there or whatever, then it, I, maybe I would have deserved it. But when it's somebody else that we care about in our lives, I think that's the hardest part. And mm -hmm. so with your, with your friend, A, you have to be proactive. You know, one of the things that we have done a good job of, even at this time, you know, if you're not an advocate for yourself, or if you don't have a friend or a loved one or a spouse or whomever that can help advocate for you, you know, you, you've got to find a way to be your own biggest advocate. You can't sit back and wait. If you have a concern, you need to get it addressed. And it's harder than ever in this time that we're living through with COVID because medical staff is stretched and, you know, it's just complicated. But, you know, you, John, are clearly acting as uh, support and uh, whether you're his mentor or, or he's yours, it, it's this symbiotic relationship that comes from shared suffering I mean, the best relationships are forged in, you know, in the trenches, as we say, and uh, he's lucky to have you. And I'm sure if the situation was reversed, you know, tomorrow that, you know, you would be lucky to have him. And I, and I think that again, you know, you, you, you know, COVID is an, the, the worst part about COVID to me is that everybody's situation, everybody's experience is really different. You know, there's, there's very few, uh, people that I've spoken to, I mean, because it runs the gamut of people who still don't believe it's real to, um, you know, people who thought that and then, you know, had a, a loved one pass away, you know, a week later. So you have to advocate for self, you have to stay connected to recovery. Uh, and I think there's tons of virtual meetings in every 12 step program out there. There's some non 12 step programs. So if you need any uh, suggestions, let me know. But I, I think it is still about, you know, addicts don't do well when we isolate. I don't care what the other problems are, but if we're not talking to somebody else that understands how we feel uh, about addiction and recovery, then we're putting ourselves into great danger. I hope he gets better soon. I'm grateful to you. Thanks, man. Thanks, John. So you can raise your hand if you have a question. I'll add one in here. This was like maybe uh, that's an interesting one. How did you pitch the Sahara Run to Matt Damon? <laughs> How did that all come about? Yeah, man. Great question. So um, I mentioned earlier I was a, a producer for Extreme Makeover Home Edition, which um, I I knew a guy who knew a guy, <laughs> and this buddy of mine. I, I was, I'm not kidding when I say I spent like months talking about the fact that I was going to be the first person to run across the Sahara. I was that, I'm probably annoying enough in most areas, but I was like, you know, I just couldn't stop talking about it to people. And this friend of mine literally said, if you will shut up, I will introduce you to this director named James Mall. And he had won the Academy Award for Best Documentary a couple of years earlier. And so, of course, I didn't shut up, but I still got the introduction. It was the single worst pitch I've ever given in my life. I showed up 15 minutes late to a 30 minute meeting. I was sweaty and just completely frazzled. And I like slid into the office going, hey, you know, Sahara Desert, never been done before. Tuareg, sand, heat. Um, my Everest and like uh, my hope going in had been that I might score a, a student director or someone that you know could help make this dream happen for me and at the end of the 10 minutes that I just did a non-stop run-on sentence um, James Mall stood up and stuck out his hand and said I'll do it well, like that was it and I, and I said what do you mean you'll do it he's like yeah he's like if you uh, you know, if you go to the Sahara, I'm going to be there with cameras. 
And he's like, but look, I need, um, I need a production company, a production partner. And a week later, he called me and Matt Damon uh, had just hung up with him. And, and so James Mall says, hey, look, I just hung up with Matt Damon. He would like to executive produce this project. And, and he also wants to narrate. Would that be okay with you? And I, I literally, because um, of course I consider myself incredibly funny. Um, I took a beat, you know, I said, you know, I'll tell you James, I was really hoping for somebody better than Matt Damon, you know, honestly, because I mean, I just think we can do better. And he was just quiet on the other side. And I said, fine. I said, yeah, Matt Damon would be just fine. And, you know, and like literally that's how it happened. And so uh, I also end up, ended up with uh, Hans Zimmer uh, doing the score on the film and like Eddie Vedder and Pearl Jam gave us music and Wyclef Jean did an original song for the film. And like, it was this, it was this crazy dream team. And the most fascinating part about it is, uh, I'll tell one more Matt Damon story, and it is in my book, but the first time I met Matt was in New York City and we went for a run together. And this is before, I mean, he had said he wanted to do this, but he wanted to meet me first. So we meet in New York, we go for a 10 mile run all around the city and uh, we finish. And Matt actually says to me, you know, he turns and said like, how do you, how can you possibly run farther than that? Like, that's the most that I can run. It's just, it's not possible for me to go farther. And I, I did say to him, uh, word for word, I said, you know, it's just not true. You know, you just have to change your relationship with pain. And it, it, I wasn't even trying to be profound or anything. I was just like talking the same way I always do. And he, that ended up being like, he used that line on stage like 20 times talking about the film and the, this project. And, and it is actually true. You know, we, what we feel like is going to happen to us is always way worse than what actually happens. And sometimes it's not, sometimes it's not way worse, but you know, we set ourselves up so often to be, um, to let ourselves down and to quit short of the goal because we don't see a purpose in continuing. And I, I say again, and there's so many people on this call who understand this, you know, just never, never pull yourself out. You never who, know who's going to get involved in your business, in your adventure. Um, and if you don't ask, uh, you don't get it. And so you have to ask people to be involved and, and more people than you think will do it. Awesome. Real quick, uh, name of the movie. Where can people watch it? Is it on? Yeah, it's called Running the Sahara. And the easiest way to get it these days is actually um, just on iTunes. You can rent it for $3.99, I think. And it's just Running the Sahara, iTunes. Um, it's about a 90 minute documentary. And it's funny for those people who, who don't know me and don't know anything about it, you know, hopefully you've got a chance to see uh, and hear a few things today that make it interesting. But, you know, I am both the hero and villain of the film. You know, I'm, I'm not always the, um, and everybody who has a business can understand this. Sometimes you have to be the bad guy. <laughs> there are times when you have to say, uh, look, we're, we're going to keep going. And I will tell you, you didn't ask me this, but I'm going to tell us one more story. Well, well it's in, funny. Uh, let me just, yeah. I'll do maybe a prequel because this relates. You can probably yeah. tie into this. You know, the last question we have on here that I did in terms of, uh, you know, the questions you submitted was about how do you deal with other people's limitations? And, you know, when someone else uh, is suffering or someone else doesn't want to do it or someone else says, you know, we need to stop or, you know, we're, you know, the team aspect of either keeping going or, or someone's just saying, uh, you know, you shouldn't do that or what, just like other people's perceptions, I guess. I mean, Man, sure what a powerful true. question, because look, it's the craziest thing, man. And I'll even go all the way back to the day I got sober in that period of time. I had so many of my friends who were drunk saying, look, you don't need to quit. You just need to slow down, man. You know, you see, you know why they said that? They said that because their biggest fear was me actually getting a life and leaving them. You know, they wanted to keep me in their misery because misery school. really does love company. You know, and I think that that's a critical point. So to answer the question, though, I'm not saying it's not real when somebody says they want to quit, but so often it's a fear of future pain or their 
they're taking the pain they're in right now. And I don't care if it's recovery, if it's a business, if it's in a physical undertaking like a race, we take the pain that we are in emotionally and physically in this moment and we project it into the future and make the assumption that not only will this pain continue, but it will probably get worse. And that's why we make big decisions at, at low moments. So the Sahara, we're in Agadez Niger in the middle of the Sahara Desert, the three runners and the crew and my two fellow runners. We don't have permission to go into Libya, which is still 300 miles away. And Libya's known we wanted to go into Libya for nine months and they haven't said yes. My two teammates come to me and they're like, you know, we're done, we quit. And, you know, there's no point in continuing this extra 300 miles because they're not going to let us into Libya. And I pitched one of my very, very famous tantrums and I throw shit and yell and I am not proud of my behavior. So I spend a lot of my life apologizing to people, <laughs> but I looked at them and I, I literally stood up and I said, I'm taking that box of Snickers bars and I'm taking that camel and I'm going to Libya and I don't give a shit what you guys do. And because I explained to them, I can live with getting to Libya and being turned away. I would know for the rest of my life, I went as far as I could possibly go. That's the, you know, like, I wouldn't lose a minute of sleep knowing that I did the best thing. What I can't live with is spending the rest of my life wondering what would have happened had we just continued. So I'm going to go see what's going to happen. I'm not pulling myself out of this until it's necessary. We continued on. I, I don't know if I guilted or shamed them or just browbeat them into continuing, but we continued. And sure enough, you know, 100 miles from the border, we get the word from the United Nations that Libya is going to let us in. And I, I think that the point is that we People want to quit things, and a lot of times it's for the wrong reason. And if you're in a team, you, know, you have to find a way to motivate and inspire the people that are around you, because later on, it's going to be their turn to do the same thing for you. People quit things. I quit things a couple of times that I regretted immensely. Um, and, you know, I had to learn those lessons the hard way. But I think that the goal is to, when someone else wants to quit, just to say, hell no, get your shit, get up and let's get going. And very often when that moment passes, you know, it, it keeps it, it keeps us all moving forward. Awesome. Awesome. So great. Uh, well, let me just uh, toss this back out to the gallery. Anyone have any uh, final questions for Charlie here or a comment that you'd like to share about something you've heard um, from the experience. I'd love to hear from the gallery. You guys are obviously still engaged and intrigued and, and man, I could listen to Charlie for hours. Uh, does anyone out there want to share a comment about uh, this adventure spotlight or Charlie's um, words or anything like that? Uh, I'd love to hear, you know, a couple of thoughts from you guys about what this experience has been like being kind of uh, having the interactive and the chance to hear directly from Charlie. Anyone want to share a word or a comment there before we bring things and wrap it up? I see Vaughn's comment. I appreciate that. He said, I quit the one that counts, which is, uh, yeah, important that I did quit doing that. So there you go. Nice. Anyone else out there? Share a comment, word, phrase, question? All right. I'm going to just jump in anyway and ask myself a question. Okay. Um, I do talk to myself a lot. I know you guys do too. Uh, I would say that the final, the, maybe a good final thought even for today is just about gratitude, yeah. you know, and, and those people in, a, in recovery understand this, but I think those who aren't also get it. You know, we, we get focused on the negative and there's only one way I've ever found one foolproof method of getting past the poor me attitude and the fear that comes with it. And that is, from gratitude. And it is just as simple very often of uh, almost like the Thanksgiving table for those of you who do that kind of thing, uh, where you, you know, you talk about what you're grateful for. And, um, you know, I think that very often it'll serve to get uh, me, I know, out of whatever funk I might be in in that particular moment. And, you know, 
so maybe everybody could take a second and 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 think or reflect upon you know what they're what they're grateful for even in these incredibly challenging times tim actually i'll ask you what are you grateful for and charlie one thing we could all do in closing too we am i on i'm on right yeah. You're on, yeah. One thing we can do too is everyone, we do this at one of my, our practices at, at work. You know, when we end a call, everyone puts their arms out to like touch each other's hands on the side and you can do that too. And we can close with that. But I think that's sort of, you know, the way to do it oh, is, you know, we're all connected somehow. We're all human beings and, you know, we, we're all in this together. No, so everyone put their hands out, make it happen, give each other a virtual hug and high five, and you're ready Woo! to go. Yeah. And just, and you know, a couple of couple final great. thoughts. You know, I, you know, the, the comment of gratitude is, you know, I, we do this instead of a you know traditional prayer every night, just saying something you're grateful for. But the practice of it, you know, just keeps your mind focused on, you know, the things that the the reframe. You know, I'm such a powerful believer in the reframe that, you know, the the <laughs> It's funny, Anisha and I, you know, started a challenge, uh, which is the yes and challenge. I said, you know, like all these different things, there's so many different variables that are going on in life right now. Instead of like whatever the concept is, instead of saying no, but like say yes and, and let's see the possibilities and what could be, you know, could be possible for whatever the situation is. But, um, and then a quick note on this, this hands of gratitude program we're doing, we're actually if anyone wants to do this during the Thanksgiving week, we're shipping out a prosthetic hand that you will put together and we'll get together as a group and you actually make the hand, it gets shipped to someone that literally doesn't have a hand and they get this new hand. And we're just doing that. It's called the Hands of Gratitude. And it's a really, really pretty cool thing. It's usually a team building program for corporate groups, but we're just gonna allow families to do it um, and ship people out those, those hands. But um, Wow. Anyway, uh, you know, I, I just want to say uh, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Ken. Thank you for everyone just staying on and for everyone that's supporting the, that's that's been here for this, our first first one. We'd love for you to fill out the the survey at the the Survey Monkey um, if you can, and join our Facebook group and uh, and keep this train going. And you know, sharing the suffering, sharing the challenge, sharing the adventure, and giving us some inspiration and motivation as we're moving through the pandemic and everything else we have in, in life, business, and sports. So um, can, I make again, a, can I make a quick comment, by the way? Sure, please, Sean. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I tell you, a, a friend of Charlie's, I've heard him speak plenty of times, like to me. <laughs> so, but this was awesome. Great platform. I'm going to do the survey, but I like the way it flowed. You guys, this is really, really great. It's a great job. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and thanks so much for the reminder that comfort is overrated. I, I'm in a, I'm at a point in my, I'm, I'm an uncertainty junkie and I love adventure. I wouldn't be on here if I didn't, but uh, I'm in a point in my, a point in my life where I'm, you know, starting a family and this whole thing. And we spend so much time chasing comforts that it's just a really good reminder to, to stay true to, to, to that, that inner adventure spirit and, and being uncomfortable and that bringing the best out of you. That's the biggest adventure right there. Right? Exactly. Talk about being uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Well, people always say, you know, I want my kids to have it so much easier than I had. I'm like, why, why would you want that? Like what, what lesson, what's in it for them to make their lives easy? They're going to have the same, complicated complex lives we're gonna have we have and and that's that's the good part it's the good part so you have to welcome that discomfort sometimes uh to move forward but i i i want to thank all of you who had such nice comments on the on the side too i've seen them all and i really appreciate it and uh i couldn't have uh, thought of a better way to spend the afternoon perfect awesome, awesome. thanks guys cool all right. Well, I think we'll uh, we'll wrap it up and and move on with the day. Here's to living the adventure, everybody. And again, we'll we'll shoot an email out with the kind of upcoming guests and get this thing rolling and charge into the new year. We are going to have a, a small group mastermind. If people are interested in joining a small group mastermind, we're going to make that available as we're going into the new year. And um, so, if that's something you're interested in, we'll get some feedback that on the Survey Monkey and. Um, yeah, here's to sharing the resource and living the adventure. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.